on with here. Excuse me. Sorry. Hey, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, pleased to welcome everybody here to the second annual James C. Lehrer Lecture here at the Miller Center, named after the famed PBS NewsHour journalist and co-founder. I'm Steve Burns. I'm chair of the Miller Center's Governing Council. Uh, special thanks to a lot of our council members who are here today. Uh, this event kicks off our spring meeting. For those of you that were not here last year, I wanted to share a little uh, origin story about the, uh, the idea for this lecture. As two former colleagues from the Miller Center board, um, Fred Scott and Alice Handy, we're both, both here today, uh, we're making the way home from Jim's memorial service in Washington. Fred proposed a lecture series to honor him. Fred and Jim shared a special bond, uh, having both served in the Marines, and it was Fred who first brought Jim to the Miller Center. A few of us on the board kicked in to fund an endowment to make it happen. And among them, Fred, Alice, and Jean Fife, long-term governing council chair. Thank you for a great idea and the means to do it. Thanks also to Jim's widow, Kate Lehrer, who's here today as well with her daughter, uh, and the George and Judy Marcus Democracy Praxis Fund for their generous financial support of this event. Finally, I'd like to give a big thanks to our PBS NewsHour partners who are producing this program with us and streaming it online. Though Jim is best known for being one of America's leading journalists as the founder and anchor of the PBS NewsHour, he was also an author, playwright, and screenwriter. Throughout his lifetime, Jim moderated no less than 12 presidential debates and covered every presidency from JFK to Barack Obama. Perhaps more importantly, this lectureship honors Jim for his character and integrity. You can get a real sense of both in a tribute to Jim that today's guest, David Brooks, wrote in the opening pages of his book, The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. It reads, when Jim was on the air and delivering the news, his face tended to be warm but stoical because he did not think he should be the story, the news should be the story. But when the camera was not on him, his face was incredibly expressive. When I was talking to our, when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was talking on our segment and I said something cheap or crass, I would see his mouth turn down in displeasure. But when I said something that was useful, <laughs> civil or amusing, I would see his eyes crinkle with pleasure. Lyra never had to formally tell me how to behave, but in this subtle and wordless way, he trained me to meet the news hour standards of what is right. In this way, Jim created the news hour way of being, a moral ecology in which certain values were prioritized and certain ways of being expected. It's been several years since Lara retired, but the culture he instilled still defines the news hour today. This was written before Jim's passing. Jim, uh, end of quote. Jim was committed to this moral ecology and devoted to allowing the facts of the news speak for themselves. And that's what David Brooks will discuss with us today. So turning to today's conversation, we are honored to have David join us for this year's lecture. David began his media career as a police reporter for the City News Bureau in Chicago before joining the Washington Times in 1984. In 1986, he joined the Wall Street Journal and ultimately became the editor of the opinion page. He served as a senior editor at the Weekly Standard magazine from its inception in 1995. Brooks then joined the New York Times as an op-ed columnist in 2003 and is also a commentator now on PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. David is also the author of several books, including his forthcoming How to Know a Person, the Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen. He teaches at Yale University and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is a graduate of the University of Chicago. I'm also very happy to introduce Bill Antholis, Director and CEO of the Miller Center, who will moderate today's conversation. 
Bill has been with the Miller Center for eight and a half years after a career in government service and think tanks in DC. Like David, he counts Jim Lehrer as a mentor. Before I turn it over to Bill and David, We'd like to pay a, a brief film that we debuted last year at the first lecture um, about Jim's legacy. So enjoy, and um, thanks for all of you uh, for being here to all of you. Good evening, I'm Jim Lara. On the news hour tonight, the news of this Friday. So being on television, particularly on live television as I was for as long as I was, it, it was every evening, it was a kind of up, kind of up experience. And, um, adrenaline? Adrenaline. And, Butterflies, uh, every night? Every, every night, because the potential for making an ass of myself on national television confronted me every moment. Not only not to, not to embarrass yourself, but also the pressure to get it right and to try to make sure that you've got all the bases covered, that you've treated somebody fairly. It's funny to think now, but I guess they, did they publicize the, the yes. route? Yes. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, it I was I wrote very... the, the story with the, with the route, that, the, the, uh, the one that uh, Oswald had in his possession. It came out the afternoon before, didn't it? That's right. That's right. <laughs> it was found in his effects. It was my story. It was on the front page of the Dallas Times Zero. And we'd only been in Washington a month, I think. We heard that in three days, PBS was going to get chopped. And then Watergate broke the morning you heard that, I think. After sure. that, it was over. PBS was just forgotten. So when we saw Watergate, it was like, oh, heaven. <laughs> Saved by some thugs. Yes. <laughs> but the, the irony, of course, the great irony was we then later broadcast the Watergate hearings, and that saved PBS. Yeah. I got a call from George H. W. Bush after, right after he'd left the White House. And he said, uh, Jim, I need a favor. Said, yes, sir. What is it? He said, well, we're going to have a little, little uh, uh, roundtable discussion in Colorado Springs about the coal. And uh, I'd like for you to moderate it. And I said, oh, Mr. President, it's a, it's a deal. But I said, I, to my credit, I said, I'm going to take a dime for this. And then quick follow-up involves Kate and me. Um, he called me again a few months later, or a year later, I don't know. He said, look, I want to do the same thing for Asia. And I said, well, sure, Mr. President, in for a nickel, in for a dollar, no deal, no big deal. <laughs> Still no pay, though. He said, fine, 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 fine. And uh, so we agreed to do it, all set to go. And then I get a call from his office saying, could you come a day early uh, for a dinner with uh, with with President and Mrs. Bush, and I reluctantly say yes, thinking it's another going to be another dinner and all that. We go downstairs, and standing there waiting for us are George and Barbara Bush, and uh, there's just, just a couple of Secret Service agents, and they put us in a car, and the four of us. Just the four of us have dinner at an Italian restaurant. They, Secret Service cleaned out the restaurant so we could do it. And we talked for two hours. Everything was off the record. It was great fun. It, it was a magic experience, you know. And I realized what he had done. He wouldn't, I wouldn't take money. So what it was the best that way. That was your honorarium. That was the honorarium. Yeah. Which was worth all and wow. priceless. Thoughtful man, though. Somebody, somebody, only a George H. W. Bush would think in those terms. There are very few nights that I left to go home to my adoring wife 
uh, and not feeling good at least about what we tried to do. Doesn't mean we always pulled it off. Sometimes we had the wrong people on the wrong story on the wrong night. But as a general rule, I always felt good about what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some times when I felt, till I was, I was so happy. We are heartbroken here at the News Hour. Jim's legacy of journalism is with us every day. Well, it's great to see everyone and really appreciative of David uh, joining us for the Lair Lecture. As I said to him beforehand, uh, we were thrilled that Judy was, as Jim's successor, our first Lair Lecturer, but uh, I know that there couldn't have been a, a, a better person to do it this year than David. So David, thank you. And especially to Kate and Amanda Lair. Uh, you know, David's line about um, Jim's frown and the crinkle in his eye, we met both. Um, Jim's frown could be devastating, for, <laughs> uh, as David might say, but uh, seeing that video really reminds us about what a special person he was. So David, what is a moral ecology? <laughs> uh, a moral ecology is a phrase I plagiarized from a guy at UVA named James Davison Hunter, uh, and he came up with that term, but I've stolen it. Um, and, and, and what Jim, well, Jim, lived in one, a thick one, uh, called the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, and if you meet a Marine, uh, you know within five minutes they were a Marine. And you knew with, within, with Jim, within five minutes they were a Marine. I remember one day on the set, during the depths of the Iraq War, we are covering a Marine funeral. Uh, and Mark Shields and I, Mark was also a Marine, uh, sitting there, and Jim was just tremendously moved by the funeral. And he starts crying. And uh, he's just dabbing his eyes as uh, while this segment is running, and they cut right to Jim, Mark, and I. And Mark and I look at each other because Jim is just bawling. And so I think Jim got one question, like four words out, and Mark gave like an eight-minute answer, and I gave a sixteen-minute <laughs> answer. We just like <laughs> it was the segment where Mark Jim was not seen at all. <laughs> but so that's a moral ecology. It's um, a moral ecology is a standard and a way of doing things. And so at the news hour, it was just that you're not going to be crass. Frankly, we're not going to be cable. Uh, we're not going to do horse race. We're not going to be unfair. We are going to be, um, we're going to be at one notch above TV. And it really mattered a lot to me that Robin and Jim were writers. Because it, TV, it's very easy to slip into a very shallow, no offense to my friends in TV, but to, ship, to slip into that, um, news hit of the moment that nobody will remember the next day. And because I think Jim and Robin had a literary sensibility, we were going to deal with an issue that you would remember that was an important issue, that was a lingering issue, not the issue blip of the moment. And so it's the sort of thing where you don't have to say that. You don't have to say that. You just Jim just embodies it. I once wrote a column uh, about how hard it is to teach, to teach moral formation in a classroom. And I got an email from a veterinarian in Oregon named Dave Jolly. And he says, Remember, never forget what a wise person says is the least of that which they give. What gets remembered is their small gestures. Uh, and never forget the, le the message is the person. And so when we think back on our teachers, we don't remember what they taught us, but we remember who they were. And when Dave Jolly wrote to me, it was about the time when Pope Francis became Pope. I thought, oh yeah, there are millions of people around the world who don't know much about Catholic theology, but they know they like that guy. And a whole moral ethos is communicated in the way he lives and acts. And as I said in that comment, Jim had passed, or had been retired, and now Jim has passed. And you know, when Judy Woodruff retired, or semi-retired, and we spontaneously took over the segment so we could honor her. And I hadn't thought about it before, but the first words out of my house my mouth were, 
Judy made everyone else around her better. And I think that's, that was part of the news hour tradition. And I'll just wrap the, some of us are watching a show called Ted Lasso. Um, and Ted Lasso is asked in the first season of that series, what's your goal here as coach of FC Richmond or whatever it is. And he says, he could have said, I want to win the FA Cup. I want to win the championship. But he says, I just want to make these fellows on the team better on and off the field. And that's a different goal for a leader. And so I think it's, a, it's just a, a, at a level of moral leadership that is above what a lot of leaders think of their role. It's really terrific. Uh, now hearing that story about Jim crying makes me feel a little uh, better about choking up about the thought of Jim. Yeah. So um, in the book, and we're going to talk about David's book, uh, The Second Mountain, which had come out in 2019, again, before Jim passed, before uh, a pretty tumultuous time in America and in the world, but it's it's such a moving and powerful book. David has another book coming out in the fall, which I think we'd like to get to as well. But this idea of a moral ecology runs through the book. And David, in, in the book, very early on, you touch on sort of four foundational moral ecologies in Western civilization. There's a Greek moral ecology that's a moral ecology that's about sort of honor and glory. There's a Judaic one that's about um, about law and obedience, um, a Christian one about humility, surrender, and, and grace, and the enlightened one here in Thomas Jefferson's hometown about reason, individual liberty, and personal freedom. Is there an American moral ecology? I sort of think so. Um, you know, the, our founders um, thought two things about human beings. One, they were gloriously made, and two, were deeply broken. Uh, and so I went to the University of Chicago. My favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and, <laughs> and so uh, we learned all these moral ecologies. And so our founders thought, they looked around at their fellow citizens and they thought, we really can't make a democracy out of these people. <laughs> and so we need to do moral formation. And the idea is that the institutions of society have to make people a little better. And what is moral formation? It's a pompous phrase, but it means a few simple things. One, uh, to be a little less selfish than you would naturally be. Two, to have an ultimate purpose and aim in life. And three, to be considered towards others in the normal complex situations of life. How to welcome somebody into your home. How to sit with someone who's in grief. Uh, how to dump somebody without breaking their heart. These are just the practical skills of being a decent person. And if you go through American history, there was not one moral philosophy that governed such a diverse society, but society was rife with morally formative institutions. And some of them were churches or synagogues or mosques. Some of them were the YMCA, the Sunday school movement. Some of them were the abolitionist movement. Some of them were the Boy Scouts and the Boy Gir Girls. But there are morally rich communities spread throughout the society. And schools thought it was their number one job to be morally formative. There was a headmaster at a place called the Stowe School in Vermont who thought our job is to create boys who are acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. And so he wanted people who were, you could count on when the times got tough. Uh, and universities, uh, Hampton Institute, there's a president there who said our job is to create character. Uh, Mount Holyoke College, they, their job was to create young women who would go out and, as they said, go where no one wants to go, do what no one wants to do. And they had rules, and one of my heroes is a woman named Frances Perkins, who was Secretary of Labor under FDR. She went to Holyoke around 1905. And they had rules at Holyoke that we would probably not apply at UPA. So some of those rules were, um, Freshmen shall not speak in the presence of sophomores. <laughs> Freshmen shall bow down and passing a sophomore on the stage. But it was to induce humility. And so there were just all this whole range of people thought our job is to form people. And then that went away. And it went away right after the war. Somehow a philosophy arose that said people are not deeply sinful, they're deeply wonderful. And you don't need to form these people, they're just naturally good. You just let them be themselves. And so you look, you know, there's this thing of Google engrams that measures how often words are used in common parlance. 
And so usage of the words like honesty, courage, virtue, humility, those usages dropped like 70% starting after the war. And you can see how morality is just not on people's minds. And so I think, I don't know if people got more selfish, I sort of doubt it, but I do think they became less skilled in the, being considered in the concrete actions of life. And as a result, I mean, the number one statistic in society to me is social trust. We trust each other. And two genera a generation or two ago, 60% of people said they trust their neighbors. Now we're down to 30% and 19% of millennials. And people don't trust each other because they find each other untrustworthy. And so I think part of that is because we've just stopped doing moral formation. And we're never gonna go back to one method. But whether it's a coach on a team or a rabbi or whatever, or a teacher. My teachers at Chicago, there's a saying, if you catch fire with enthusiasm, people will come for miles to watch you burn. <laughs> and my professors, they believed if we read these books, we would lead good lives. And I, that, that has never left me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we just need a diversity of morally formative institutions. And we, we have to think of our universities that way. And we, more often than not, universities are there to help people professionally, but not help people morally. You, you talk in the book, the first mountain is essentially the mountain of individual and personal accomplishment. And you talk about hyper individualism. To, to unpack that a little bit for us. What is hyper individualism? Yeah, it's the idea that um, I am I am in control of my own destiny uh, and that I am an autonomous individual and the, the highest value that I celebrate is the ability to have freedom of choice. And it's a it's a philosophy that puts um, that sort of isolates one person from another that puts individual happiness at the apex of what it desires. Uh, if you use if you look at they have these things called narcissism tests. And they ask people, do you agree with the following statements? Uh, somebody should write a book about me because I'm so remarkable. Uh, I, I find it easy to manipulate people because I'm so extraordinary. And so the median narcissism score in the last 30 years has gone up 25%. Uh, and so it, you've just seen this rise of people at least wanting to think well of themselves, but unintentionally thinking ill of themselves because they don't measure up to, they, they can't do it alone. We tell that we give all our, we, if you go to commencements, even at the Saint at UVA, we give young people, we pile them on with a mountain of debt and then give them crap advice so they'll never be able to pay that off. And one of those piece of crap advice is be true to yourself. Come up with your own philosophy. If your name is Aristotle, maybe you can do that. The rest of us don't come up with your own philosophy. <laughs> um, and so I'll just give you one little vignette that's summarized for me the, the shift from one ethos to another. And I don't say this in a tone of nostalgia because I don't want to go back, but just to show the shift. So if I hope you get WAMU, uh, NPR station in DC here, but on Sunday nights, they broadcast old radio shows. And one night I'm driving home on a Sunday night and I'm listening to a show called The Big Broadcast, which was a variety show that went out to the troops in World War II. And I happened to be listening to the show that was broadcast live on VJ Day, the day they learned the one war. Bing Crosby's the host, gets out there and he says, you know, I guess at a moment like this, we're not proud. We're just glad we got through it. And we're just humbled. And then later Burgess Meredith gets out there and he reads a passage from Jimmy Pyle, Jimmy um, Pyle, the journalist, the war journalist. Um, Ernie Pyle, that's it, I knew I had that wrong. Uh, and he says, we didn't win the war because we're braver. We didn't win the, war, win the war because we're better as a people. We won the war because we have a lot of material strength and we have a lot of great allies. We should just try to be worthy of the peace. And I was just struck by the tone of humility at the moment when they won World War II. And so I turn off the radio, go on the TV, turn on the TV, watch a football game, and I watch a defensive player make a tackle after a two yard gain. And he does what all professional athletes does. He does a dance in a celebration of himself. And I realized I've, I've just seen a bigger celebration after a two yard gain than I'd seen after winning World War II. And that's the shift from it, uh, uh, ethos of, of equality and togetherness. I'm no better than anybody else, but nobody's better than me to a, an ethos of look at me. I'm, I'm accomplished, I'm a, a, a culture of achievement. And as I say, we, we're never gonna go back to the World War II culture, nor should we, 
but that we have something to learn from a culture that truly is, we're all in this together. So there, there's a terrific series of discussions in the books where you connect that hyper-individualism with tribalism. And it seems somewhat counterintuitive if we're obsessively individualistic. How does that then lead to us being tribal? What's the, what's the nexus there? Yeah, well, two, two things. One, if you leave human beings naked and alone, they do what their evolutionary roots tell them to do, which is they revert to tribe. So that, that's part of what's happened. The second thing that's happened, it goes back to my loss of moral formation. If you leave people in a moral vacuum where there's no, mora no, there's no short, shared morality, they don't have a sense of either a shared classical culture, or a shared Christian culture, a shared Jewish culture, a shared military culture, whatever the moral culture is. And so there's a, there's a sense of moral vacuum. And politics appears to be a way to solve that problem because politics gives you a moral landscape. There's good, which is on our side and bad over there. Politics gives the illusion of moral action. I get to be indignant at the right people. Politics give, seems to give you the illusion of community because we're all in this fighting those bad guys. But of course, it's not a real moral landscape. You don't have to be a good person to be on one political side or another. You just have to be liberal or you just have to be conservative. It's not really community because you're not actually sitting with the widow or feeding the poor. You're just like on one side. And so it gives you the illusion of having a worthwhile moral life without having to do anything morally interesting or demanding. And so it's weirdly out of that vacuum that politics emerges as a, there's a therapist at the line, uh, the hardest thing to cure is the patient's attempt to self cure. And so the over politicization of life is our attempt to self cure from the under moralization of life. <laughs> Um, you know, you offer a counter in the book, and it starts with something you called relationalism. Uh, and the book is terrific in that it touches on stages of life and how people come to rediscover it, particularly after they've had accomplishments in the first mountain. Um, and then there's often a decline, sometimes connected with depression. Um, and then you get this, occasionally, if you're lucky, a second mountain where you climb and you build a set of relationships. So. Um, what is relationalism? Is it a belief system? Is it a set of practices? How does one practice relationalism? Yeah. Well, first, I don't want to set myself as, as the model. Like I wrote a book about how you should not care about money, material status. And the book comes out, I'm on book tour. I'm checking my damn Amazon rating every hour. Like, how am I <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, But, you know, I, I think it was an attempt I had founded this organization called Weave, which was an attempt to celebrate people who really are living for community. Uh, and we, we thought, how do you do culture change? We, the idea was to create a, a shift in culture to help contribute to a shift in culture toward a more communal, relational, moral culture. And so well, we said, how do you do culture change? How do you shift a culture? Uh, and the theory we had, or I had, was that culture change, when it's, Cultures change when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy them. And that was no great insight. All I did is look at one of the great culture change organizations of the world, which is the church. And so Jesus and 12 guys, or 11, um, shipped, like pretty impressive, 12, 11 guys and advantage, he had an advantage being the savior, that would help. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, in, in 300 years, Christianity spread everywhere. And so we did everything that, that the church had <laughs> at Weave. We created small groups. We created a manifesto or a gospel, which was that uh, relational thing. Uh, and we had disciples spreading around. And we had exemplars. And so we would go into McCook, North Carolina, or McCook, Nebraska, Wilkes, North Carolina, and we would find amazing people. And so, and we would just bring them on NPR, we'd bring them South by Southwest. We just wanted to tell them stories so people would say that's an amazing life. And so there was a guy ran into, I could tell you a zillion of these stories named Pancho Arguilas in Houston. Um, and he would, he worked at a, founded a place called Living Hope Wheelchair Association for mostly Mexican uh, undocumented workers who had been paralyzed in construction accidents. And he would give them wheelchairs and diapers and catheters, and he trained them to be social workers. 
So you're in a neighborhood in Houston and 25 Hispanic guys on wheelchairs wheeling your neighborhood to be social workers. And he's one of the most holy people I've ever met. I said to him once, you just radiate holiness. He said, no, I reflect holiness, which is the good answer. Uh, but so we just wanted to show these people are joyous. These people live deeply relational lives. And I over theorized it with this relational manifesto. But I will say being around people like that, there, there really are people in this world who lead lives of selfless love. And I met hundreds of them. And I bet if I asked you who's trusted in this neighborhood, you could all list those people. And so we just wanted to say, no, that that life really is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, David, a good point to, to uh, just jump forward to the, to the next book, because I think it's connected to this. Uh, as you were telling me about it a little bit, it's, um, it has a number of different dimensions about making human connections. And I wondered if you give us a little bit of a preview of, uh, if, if, if you're sure. at liberty yeah. to do so with your publisher, a preview of, uh, <laughs> of where this goes in the, in the next chapter. As it were. Yeah, I mean, I decided that I was talking about community and relationship, but it, um, uh, it was too abstract. Uh, that it's, it's not enough to do that. You have to describe how exactly do you make somebody feel seen? How exactly do you make somebody feel considered when they're, if they're anxious at a meeting and they're just sitting in a corner, how do you welcome them in? Uh, and so the book is an attempt to um, make people feel, give people the social skills so when they walk in a room, they'll know how to make other people feel seen, heard, and understood, and respected. And if you ask how good do you think you are at this right now, like how good are you making at understanding other people and making them feel understood? I don't know most of you, but I can tell you with a high degree of confidence, you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> that the average person, people study this at the University of Texas, if, if you meet somebody and you're the average person and you're trying to figure out what they're thinking, you're accurate about 22% of the time. And if you're really good, you might have 50% of the time. And a lot of people are right 0% of the time and think they're right 100% of the time. And so it's meant to walk people through from the first gaze, the first time I see you, how do I look at you? I want to look at you with that atmosphere of reverence and respect. And then you walk through the process. So, and a lot of it is conversation. It's about being a good conversationalist. And so just like two pages of the book, I'll give you a few conversational tips. Uh, one is be a loud listener. I have a friend, when you talk to him, he's like a, uh, a congregation at a Pentecostal church. He's like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, preach, preach. I just love talking to that guy because he just is a loud listener. Um, Make them authors, not witnesses. When people are telling you a story, they don't go into enough detail. And so if you say, where was your boss when he told you that, then suddenly they start narrating their story and you learn a lot more of who they really are. Keep the gem statement at the center. If my brother and I are disagreeing about our dad's health care, we may disagree about that, but there's one thing we agree upon, which is we won't, both want what's best for our dad. And so if we return to that, the gem statement, will repair our relationship as we disagree. Final one I'll give you is um, don't fear the pause. I got this from improv person. I, imagine we're talking and my answer is I start at my shoulder and I talk off to my fingertips. At what point have you stopped listening in order to think of what you might say? It's probably here. So let me talk to my fingertips. And then if you need to pause and then respond. And so they're just basic skills of, um, of how to be a good conversationalist. Uh, and you know, Jim, that was his job. And the way Jim would do it is Mark and I would be on the set and Mark would say something. And instead of just like another long answer, the question that had nothing to do with what Mark would just say, he'd pick out the three crucial words Mark would say and he'd just repeat them to me. And then it was short, it gave me no time to think, uh, but it got to the essence. And so then it was essence, essence. And that came from just raw good listening skills. And then the final thing I'll say is, is I, I'm now acutely aware of how many people ask questions in a conversation. And I'll go to a party and I'll think, I'll walk out thinking, nobody asked me a question that whole time. Some people are plenty interesting, they just don't ask questions. And so how good are you at, are at asking questions? And how good are you at, at asking big questions, the questions that'll create a conversation that you're gonna remember? And so I was at, you know, one of the questions to ask is, um, 
What crossroads are you at? Most of us are at a crossroads. And if you ask that question, suddenly you have a big conversation. I have a friend who was at a job interview and the, he was being the one interview, but at the end, he turned to the interviewer and said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? She started crying because she wouldn't be doing HR at that company if she wasn't afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked my students at Yale, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And every year I get a couple of kids saying, if I wasn't afraid, I'd leave Yale. It's not the right school for me, but I need the prestige. And so that's, that opens things up. I'll just close with a couple. Of, I'm a fan of these questions. Um, there's a guy named Peter Block who's a great writer about community. He, he has questions that are really big, like you have to know somebody before you ask these questions. What forgiveness are you withholding? What commitment have you made that you no longer believe in? And so, the, the, and just finally, I had a conversation with somebody else, and the question was, um, with the whole dinner table, how do your ancestors show up in your life? We're all formed by ancestors going back centuries, and they all show up in our life in a certain way. We had just a great conversation. Everybody left feeling not only that they understood each other better, but they understood themselves better. So the book is really an attempt to just practically help people be better converse, better relators, and hence better human beings. <laughs> um, the, the second mountain book, the one that you've already written, has these three sort of central chapters that get at a lot of these. As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking it, it reflects back on these chapters about marriage, faith, and philosophy. Um, and the marriage one in particular is really tied into how you manage a relationship and whether you're listening and paying attention and being present in a, in a relationship. And you, you are very honest and, and personal about your own uh, both first marriage and um, and your recent remarriage. Um, uh, at some point in the book, you also talk about that as a metaphor for where we are as a country. Um, and this is again 2019 before the phrase political divorce starts entering in the yeah. in the conversation. So I just I, I wonder how you think about that now, maybe as a way to start thinking about and talking about where we are in 2023 as opposed to 2019. Um, is that part of it? Do we just not listen to each other anymore? Or is something even deeper happening? I, I would say first, you know, I, I may be inspired by Jim or others. I, when I got my job at the New York Times, I was hired as a conservative columnist at the Times, which is a job I liken to being the chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but I decided I'm gonna do something silly or simple. Every time I talk to a Republican, I'm gonna to talk to a Democrat, one-to-one. -one. It's just a quota system. And the first thing I learned, and this was 20 years ago, they know nothing about each other's worlds. I'd walk from a Republican's office to a Democrat's, the Democrats would tell me what the Republicans are thinking. I always felt like saying, I just spoke to him, that's not what he's thinking, but they had no idea. And then that was replicated na nationally. And so I would say the, the amount of social ignorance between the two groups is just immense. That's not the only thing that's causing this. Uh, there are conflict entrepreneurs who make money off this. Uh, there's genuine differences of values. Um, and there's a lot of social pain that causes people to react and to tell a story in one way or another. But um, I had forgotten that I'd written it like a national divorce um, because <laughs> the way I see the country is as a reflection of me. <laughs> um, no, uh, but you know, it's clear that um, we, we now can barely um, sit at the same Thanksgiving table or occupy the same institutions. And frankly, in the media, one of our problems, one of the core problems in the media over the last 60 years is that we um, basically exiled the working class. Uh, and this happened about 60 years ago, where if you did not, it used to be if you didn't go to college, you couldn't get a job. Then it became if you didn't go to one of the 20 elite schools, you couldn't get a job. And now I notice this, I ask my colleagues, what high school did you go to? And it's like, well, I went to Andover, I went to Exeter, I went to Choate, I went to Groton, I went to Brearley, I went to National Cathedral School. It's like, do we even have any public school kids anymore? The level of Cultural segregation in the media is, frankly, a crime. Like, would it kill us to hire somebody from Penn State? <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, uh, but so uh, that's, so we did that. And it turns out if you tell 50% of the country their voice is not worth hearing, they're gonna react badly. Uh, and so that, that was part of the segregation. Uh, and my basic line of where we are, why we have these populist uprisings, not only in the US, but in the UK and France and uh, Hungary and all across the world, is that the top 20 educated percent of each country sent their kids off to nice universities where they married each other, where they produced kids who they invested a lot of money in, who then went off to the same schools where they married each other and then they moved to Washington, Denver, Los Angeles, New York. And 80% of the country is looked and said 20% of this country has a lot of cultural power, a lot of media power, a lot of financial power. Something's out of whack here. And so populism is a rebellion against that. And as someone who sits squarely in that top 20%, it's sort of on us to have created this problem. And that doesn't excuse everything that the populists stand for by a long shot, but we shouldn't assume this is a story in which we're completely the heroes. Um, we, had, we had talked earlier about um, these two columns that you wrote, one last year on capitalism and one just a few weeks ago on capitalism. And I'm just wondering how, how in your mind it connects to this populism. And I can explain that I can, I can explain, or you can yeah. explain the two, the two columns. One was last year where I think the, the Times asked a number of its columnists and a few others what you got wrong in the last year. And then you wrote this piece uh, a couple of weeks ago about capitalism. You want to talk about those? Sure. Well, uh, and that how it connects. To the yeah. Populism. I mean, that I was, I worked at the Wall Street Journal editorial page for nine years. So I was pretty free market. And I covered the end of the Soviet Union for the journal before that. And so I saw what planned economy, what it really was an evil empire. Reagan was right about that. Uh, it was a system of economics that led to human degradation. Uh, and so I became, I was very free market. But then as the 90s and especially the early 2000s went by, it just became blatantly obvious to me that the so many of the productive people in society were not being fairly rewarded, that the capitalist system had fundamentally broken down in a way that made it fundamentally unfair, and that a lot of us who were in the information age business um, were aloof to and callous toward some of the pains and sufferings borne by those in more physical labors. I, I was out in South Dakota, this is before Trump, and I met a guy who was 70 or so, and he said, let me tell you about the best day of my life. And he said, it was 35 years ago, I was the foreman of a little part of a plant, and we made the units that cover refrigeration units on the top of big buildings. And they got new equipment that I was not trained to be the foreman of. So I got laid off. And I was just got in my little office there, I was gonna pack up my box and just walk out of there and just, I didn't want any big to do. So he picks up his box, he opens his open door, and there's a line, a double line of human beings, 3,500 people, the entire workforce of the plant, uh, from his office door to his car door in the parking lot. And he walked down this tunnel of people clapping for him, because he had been so appreciated. And he said, that was the best day of my life. And he said, I've had 35 years worth of jobs ever since, and each one has been worse. And so he was just, his life had really gone downhill for 35 years. And so I think a lot of us who were praising the market were, um, were not adequately in touch with that. And so it caused me to basically rethink and become much more free, much less free market, probably more, God help me, a Biden Democrat or something. Um, <laughs> My hero, Isaiah Berlin, said he was happy to be the rightward edge of the leftward tendency. <laughs> <laughs> and these days I'm happy to be there, I think. But that doesn't mean that American capitalism is still not immensely powerful and awesome. <laughs> um, our standard of living, our productivity, I mean, I lived in Europe for five years. Our productivity levels, our standard of living, the amount of social mobility, uh, The Economist did a big cover story on this with the tons of stats. I, like we in Europe were here about 10, 20 years ago. Now the US has just shot up in measure after measure. Uh, and you know, Silicon Valley happened here. 
I'm obsessed with AI now. That happens here mostly. Um, and so there's still something pretty special about the American mode of capitalism. Um, so I don't want to walk away from Milton Friedman entirely. I will mention my first appearance on PBS. So I, had, I was a humor columnist at the University of Chicago. And William F. Buckley comes to campus. I've told this story a few times. but um, And I wrote a parody for, of him for being a name-dropping blowhard. And it was like, a, I don't know, it was like, while it, it was a biography of his life. Of, while at Yale, Buckley formed two magazines, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review, which <laughs> he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. And then it was like, and then, um, so he came to campus. He said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, he liked it. He thought it was funny. And I want to give you a job. And I wasn't in the audience. I was, had been hired by PBS when I was 21 to debate Milton Friedman on national TV. And back then I was a socialist. And you can go on YouTube and type Milton Friedman, David Brooks. You'll see a 21 year old me with gigantic hair and these 1980s glasses, these big uh, 1980s style glasses, which are apparently on loan from the, like the Mount Palomar Lunar Observatory, these gigantic. Uh, and, the show was um, me quoting some argument I'd read in a book, Friedman destroying it in six seconds, <laughs> and then the camera lingering on my face for about 19 or 20 seconds while I tried to think <laughs> something. Um, but I, I just, I don't fully walk away from Milton Friedman, but the purism of that, that the Republican Party got itself into, in my, my view, was now vastly overstated and in some ways harmful. Um, I should should mention the last partnership we did with the News Hour. Judy came back. Judy Woodruff came back here uh, in March of this year because we had a major conference on democracy and capitalism, and it's a new project that we've done at the center here that we're really excited about. Uh, um, so, if I can, let's spend a little bit of time on the last uh, four years since since the second mound, and then we'll turn to some students for some questions. Um, so, you know, you, you talk about this fraying of the social fabric. That's what I take weavers to mean. It's about how we keep our social fabric together. Uh, and it was fraying at the time, and you have this very hopeful call at the end for a declaration of interdependence. I say that here in Charlottesville, the home of the author of the Declaration of Independence. And it's, it ends, I think, on a very optimistic note. And then we get a pandemic, and we get a 2020 election, um, and debates about a war in Ukraine, uh, where people are like living for democracy. Uh, are we, and calls for national divorce, are we, are we coming apart or are we keeping it together? Is there, is there something that pulled us together in this time or is it as bad as it seems a lot of the time? Yeah, I, I'm um, uh, known at the times as the wildly inaccurately optimist person. Uh, and I, I'll say this, I've, I've been helped over the last, especially through COVID and through Floyd and through the tumult of 2020, uh, by a book that was written by Samuel Huntington, a Harvard political scientist, who many of us have read, or some of us maybe have known. Um, and he wrote a book in 1981 called The Politics of Disharmony. And he said, I noticed this pattern in American history where every 60 years or so, we go through what he called a moral convulsion. And it's a time when people get disgusted with established power, there's bitter division, a new communications technology comes on the scene, a new highly moralistic generation comes on the scene demanding change, outsider groups demand to be included. And he said this happened in the 1770s with the revolutionary generation, happened in the 1830s with the age of Jackson, happened in the 1890s with the Industrial Revolution, that whole tumult, happened in the 1960s. So in 1981, he writes, you know, I don't know if I believe in 60 year cycles, but if the pattern holds sometime around 2020, we'll have another moral convulsion. I was like, pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> um, and so the good news about moral convulsions is we come out of them. And what happens is you go through a period where you build up a system, it stops working and you have to chop it up. And those periods of chopping it up are tumultuous and look terrible. And 1968, you know, you think of all the things that happened that year. Uh, and yet, by 1975, they weren't planting bombs at the University of Wisconsin Math Department. They were into crystals and ests, and uh, they, they, 
it, the convulsion passed. But it was a different culture. If you look at a high school yearbook in 1965, it's all guys in crew cuts. 68, it's half crew cuts and half long hair. And by 75, it's all long hair. And so the culture shifts. And so the culture shifted in the 60s. And I think we're in the midst of a very rapid period of cultural shift. Uh, and I think the, some of the harshness of the bitterness and censoriousness of, um, well, I'll go full optimist here. I'm, to, I'm declaring my colors. I think the American public has built a wall to prevent Donald Trump from, never, from not getting the White House ever again. I say that with a little less confidence than I did after the midterms, but I still fundamentally believe that. Uh, I'm someone who's not thrilled by some of the canceled policies, the free speech, uh, the inhibition of speech on campuses and elsewhere. But I think the pressure has dropped on that. As someone, that, there's one thing I'm well, I worked at the New York Times, Yale, PBS, The Atlantic. I'm well informed on culturally slightly center left organizations. And the idea that you are scared to talk in public, that, that was true in 2020, it's not true anymore. We're much more open about having conversations about anything. And so I think we're past the peak of that. Uh, and I think we're now cohering into more communal culture. We're just fighting about what kind of community we want to have. And so I do, I do think we're coming out, we're past the peak of, of turmoil, of hatred, and ripping apart, and we're slowly piecing the other pieces of reconstruction. Um, David, thank you so much for that. Um, we'll now turn to some student questions. We did this last year, and this was something actually that Judy Woodruff in planning her visit said she really wanted to have some student engagement. We thought we have such terrific students who are um, often interns here or have been students in classes that various Miller Center faculty have taught, um, and uh, we wanted to give them the floor. Um, so uh, we'll I really don't care about your questions. You can email Judy. <laughs> 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 uh, I've stolen this from David from uh, a video of my own. So I want you to have a long statement. And if you feel like you have to put a question mark at the end, just don't don't even worry about it. Uh, now, please, uh, we'll start with Grady Martin. Grady has been my intern for the last year. Grady's been working with me on, um, he's a political and social thought major, just handed in his uh, dissertation. So I think he's done. Uh, fourth year student um, is going to be a uh, paralegal in a, in a firm in DC for the summer. And um, Grady has been my intern working on a project on um, uh, potentially fixing the American presidency, but I have no idea what he's gonna ask, so Grady, fire away. Yeah, sadly, I don't think we can fix the American presidency in the next 20 minutes of this talk. Uh -huh. um, but you know, being about to graduate UVA, as well as everyone else here, or at least the five other students here, you know, having gone through, I think, a really amazing, right, like institution with such a great moral ecology. It's also been really at the center of a lot of these culture war, this political tumult in a way that most universities have not. Um, you know, I kind of wanted just to ask what your thoughts might be, right, for a group of people who are about to, you know, kind of leave the confines of the space, enter into the real world during this period, right, of great political change. And especially considering, right, kind of the themes of your last two books being like finding joy and understanding a kind of sense of self. Any advice you might have for young people like us, you know, embarking on this next big uh, part of our lives? Yeah, I guess the first thing that leaps to mind is all your life as students are station to station. So somebody assigns you a paper, you do the paper, somebody, there's a test, there's something to apply for. When you get out into the world, there are no more stations. <laughs> There, you're just floating in a, an open sea with no markers, and you have to invent your own. Uh, and so it's a fundamentally different thing. And so one of the things I've learned from my own students is that a certain number of them come back, they'll call me five years out, and their, their formerly self-confident voice is gone. They're humbled, they've had bad voices, bad bosses, emotional breakups, it's just a hard period. Uh, and so like here in the last four years, you've had highly intelligent people paid to read what you write and listen to what you say. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not gonna happen anymore. <laughs> um, and so the one thing, a couple practical bits of advice. One practical one is 
10, find 10 of your best friends here and form a giving circle and say, we're going to get, we're going to put money into a pot every year and we'll get together every year for three or four days and we'll decide where to give, give it away. And the point is not to give out money though. That's nice. The point is so you have a group of 10 friends to carry with you for the rest of your life. And that will prove immeasurably valuable. And you need to you need to concentrate on that sort of thing. And so that's one thing. And then uh, the other thing I'll say, and this is my students never wanted to hear this, but I'm going to say it because I care about it. It's about marriage. So in the next five years, 15 years of your life, you're going to make four life transforming decisions. One is going to be probably not necessarily, but probably who to marry. One is it going to be where do you live? What community do you really attach to? Another is going to be what vocation you're going to go into. And the fourth will be what philosophy or faith. And you've probably thought about your vocation a fair bit. And you hopefully have thought about your philosophy or faith. If you're like my students, you haven't thought about your marriage. And one of my students said, a marriage is a box that's going to come in the mail when I'm 35. <laughs> it's just a really important decision. So you don't have to get married. I would not recommend getting married right away. Um, but think about it. And uh, my one little sermon on this is that a marriage is a decades long conversation. Find somebody you can talk to for the rest of your life. You don't want to be one of those quiet couples at Applebee's staring at each other. <laughs> um, second, um, love comes and goes, but admiration sticks around. Find somebody you admire. And then the final thing I'll say, I got this from C.S. Lewis, the, um, uh, there are three kinds of love. There's eros, which is passion. There's philia, which is friendship. And there's agape, which is selfless love. And if you just have eros, you have a hookup, but you don't have a marriage. You should have all three. And so I know you didn't ask that question thinking you were going to get a sermon on marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just like, if you get that one right, your life will, you'll have a real cushion in life. So think of, that's, a, that's why the sermon. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Eva Suravel. Eva was my summer intern last summer working on this same presidency project. Um, she has been the editor-in-chief of the student newspaper here, the Cavalier Daily, oh, and is an English and French double major, even though her heart beats politics. So, Eva? <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I feel a lot of pressure asking a question, both because you gave such excellent question suggestions earlier and because of the journalism. Um, but my question is based on a column of yours that I read um, semi recently about patriotism. Um, so I'm curious if you could sort of like expand on how you think patriotism is linked to everything that you've talked about today. Um, but also one big problem that you have described is sort of younger generations being less patriotic and this need um, to sort of like reinvigorate patriotism in younger generations. So I guess I'm curious, given that we have a number of students here today, um, but also because you teach sort of like, why do you think younger generations, should, like why should they be patriotic and, and what is there to like remain patriotic about? Yeah, uh, well, you know, my grandfather was an immigrant uh, and so, you know, we were raised um, with the sense he came here, a uh, butcher, produced a professor, produced a journalist. And it just, it just, the magic, the American dream in my family just totally worked. Uh, and so I was raised with a ferocious love of country. Uh, and I was once at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York with, and we were looking at a, a portrait of George Washington, and it was with a friend of mine who's not the direct descendant of George Washington, because nobody is, but an indirect descendant. And he said, what's it like for you when he's not the father of your country, but he, he's related to me, he's the father of my country? And I was like, that thought never occurred to me. Of course <laughs> he's the father of my country. Like, and so I, I think that sense of patriotism comes not from a sense that the country is not, is perfect, um, you don't love, when you love another person, you love the good parts and the bad parts. Uh, and when you love a philosophy or faith, if you're a member of a church, I have people who are devout Christians and the church they belong to drives them crazy. And so love is complicated. And yet to me, the more love you can have in your life 
the more rooted you are, the more you have something to live for. And so patriotism is just love of every particular place. Love of it because it's yours. And without you having to do anything, generations of people, some free, some slave, of different cultures, of different colors, um, bequested to you an amazing set of gifts. They bequested to you, you, know, you the, the very language you th speak with is something they gave you, that the past gave you. The assumption, or at least the ideal, that we should treat each other radically equally is something that somebody before you gave you. And so one of my problems with autonomy liberalism is the idea that we're responsible for ourselves, we're property for ourselves, and that we can do what we want because we own our own property. To me, that's just not what life is like. We are inheritors of gifts and bestowers of gifts. And so to be in a school like this is just to have been given a great gift by people who came here or built this place, I don't know how many, 200 and some odd years ago. And so to always be conscious of being part of that great procession. And you may be a little peon, we're all little peons at the end of the great procession. But just to see yourself across the time span of centuries as one to whom gifts have been bestowed. Uh, and it's our job just to give them, pass them along, hopefully a little better. To me, that's just an inspiring way to think of your life as part of a, a magical process uh, to which we should all be for even the sins of the country, which I'm not minimizing. I'm not, you know, a Jew. I don't know if I could have gotten in here 50 years ago, but um, let alone, you know, slavery and all the Native Americans and all the rest. But uh, to me, to be part of that great procession is just one of the great adorations uh, to live within. So I, I do get, I do think, and I, I just wonder about a generation that doesn't have as much love, much to love. Uh, and so I try to preach um, loving what you've been given, or at least thanking people for it. Thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue off um, the reflection on immigration and call up uh, Lydia Neguse. Uh, Lydia is a second year, at the end of her second year, rising third year, and actually um, comes from Ethiopia. Um, started in a small Christian school in Southwest Virginia. Uh, she's the younger sister of a student of mine, but I've, uh, who was a nursing student, but since Lydia's interest her in politics, her sister um, handed her over to me for, uh, 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 for looking forward to the next generation in her family. And I don't know if I've been a good mentor, but I've uh, enjoyed getting to know Lydia. So Lydia, please. Hi. Um... I thought your lecture on the moral ecology and also your op-ed on Joe Biden and saving the American soul um, was wonderful and something that I had personally been thinking about for a while. Um, like you said, I grew up in a, a Christian um, boarding school. And something that we talked about a lot was just um, the loss of, like you said, community and love in institutions, in the schools, in the neighborhoods. and. Um, I came to this big university. Um, my school is very small, so I came to this big university not really knowing what to expect and, you know, really thrown into the real world and how people interact with each other and how people love each other, you know, when you're not just a small group of people that are kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, so you just rely on each other. Um, and to that point, um, I see this, I guess, demise crawling up into some of the highest offices in our country. And what are some, or do you think there's even a possibility of positive change that we could, like that that we could improve upon, with some long-term changes in terms of fixing this dog versus this dog, this us versus them um, type of mindset? And do you think that it's something that it's kind of you know impossible or? something that's, you know, viable. Can I just ask you, when you came from the smaller Christian school to the pluralistic place like this, did you find a sense of community and cohesion? Did... Um, in a sense, it just uh, took a while because um, a lot of people, you know, it's a lot of people that come from a lot of different backgrounds and you have to balance respecting and loving other people no matter if you disagree with them. Um, but it's something that 
that comes with time. And you know, all good things come with time, so yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I guess the, the one thing that leaps to mind as you were talking is just the power of politics. And this is why the Miller Center exists, that it's easy to think politics is all corrupt and broken and nothing happens. But I, I just, last year I lost a friend of mine named Michael Gerson, who's also on the PBS NewsHour. And Mike used to say, if you don't care about politics, that's a sign of your own privilege because you live in a society that gives you the luxury of not caring about politics. That if you live in a country where somebody is going to shoot you in the back of the head or they're going to have to pay a bribe every five years, you don't have the luxury of not caring about politics. And so Mike went into um, government. He worked for in the Senate and then he worked for President George W. Bush. And as a member of the Bush administration, he was a chief proponent of what became known as PEPFAR, which is the President's Initiative on HIV in Africa. And he was, one, I would say, one of the four or five key people who pushed that. And so that program is credited with saving 25 million lives. Now, Mike died recently, but he could, he had in his final days, I was with him in his final days, he could think I was part of a program that helped save 25 million lives. And I would say when I talk to people who've served in government, that for most of them, those years in government were the crowded hours of their life. Uh, I had a friend, not a friend, but an acquaintance, this guy named Dick Darman, who served for George H.W. Bush. And I had lunch with him one day toward the end of his life. And at that moment, he was serving as a three, CEO of three different companies. And he said, there's not one day in my current life that I make as many consequential decisions as one hour when I was in government. The dollar amounts are big. The, the, thing, the effect you can have on people is really big. And so I just celebrate the nobility of public service. And, you know, and the quality of people, people rail against federal bureaucrats. I occasionally get to sit in on meetings at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or they're like not glamorous. The quality of the people is very high. And they're in it for the right reasons. Even members of Congress are in it for the right reasons. Um, when you see how unglamorous their lives are, if you've ever fly out of Washington, Reagan, on a Thursday afternoon when they're flying home, they all got to schlep back to their districts. Um, they're on the planes, the senators in first class, the House of Representatives in the back. Uh, and, but they do it because they really want to, they love the country, they want to do some good. And there's a part of government that we in the media don't cover enough, which really is about where, look, a lot of bills got passed in the last Congress and trillions of dollars were spent. And we passed one program, the child tax credit, which reduced child poverty by something like 35 or 50%. Like, so if anybody doesn't think they could make a difference, I can, every day I could point to a, something that some level of government does that really makes a difference. And so I have tremendous faith in that. So thank you. It's really thank great. You. Next call on Anna Heat Dirks. Anna has been an intern of ours this year. Um, as you probably know or, or may have heard, uh, back in November, three student athletes were killed here at UVA. And the university started up a lab to look at gun violence and how to address gun violence here at the Miller Center. We've been thinking about and trying to participate in that. Anna has put together a news aggregator that, um, uh, that lists both news stories about mass killings, but also political analysis, sort of like what you do in the, in the Sydney Awards every year, trying to collect the best writings on gun violence. I'm, I'm not sure what she's gonna ask about, but Anna's been terrific. She's uh, a rising, it's complicated. She's a rising fifth year student in an accelerated master's program at the Batten School, but she's done that in, she's at the end of what should be her fourth year, and she's done that in three years. So um, she's going to finish a five year master's in four years. Okay. Um, thank you for being with us today. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, about your, your, this relates to your article on patriotism as well. That you talk about declining patriotism, especially among young people, um, as Eva mentioned, and how that's partially a function of social distrust. And we've kind of gotten ourselves into, I think the phrase you use is a distrust doom spiral. Um, and 
when I look out, like I see that sense of distrust, like really reinforced in a lot of what's happening in the world. Like I see a lot of good reasons to be distrustful of society. I think especially this goes to gun violence, but these recent incidents of gun violence that just happen in like everyday interactions between neighbors, um, it makes it seem like kind of terrifying in a lot of ways to, to go out and to, and to like put yourselves in those, in those social situations. So I was just wondering in light of that, like what actions do you think we can take as a whole, but especially college students, young people to break that doom spiral, even when it, it seems dangerous? Yeah, well, you're not wrong. Like, like I said, the reason people are distrustful is because people have been untrustworthy. And I used to talk to my students and, say, and talk about distrust, and one young woman said, have you seen our social lives? Like when I'm getting ghosted by people, like, yeah, I'm gonna be a little wary. Uh, and so I, I guess I would say um, a couple things. First, if you really, if you study history, you learn that while things are bad now, they've pretty much always been pretty bad. <laughs> There's always been like, would you want to have lived through the 1860s? Would you want to live through the 1870s, which were a period of immense economic turmoil? What year would we want to go back to? Uh, would we want to live through the Cold War? We want to live in a world where we basically, um, I have a friend who, when asked about the health of this country, says, take a legal pad and write all the problems we have down on the left column. And then on the right side, write, we have more talent than ever before. And the right side is more important than the left side. So would we want to go back to an age where we utilized the talent of white male Protestants and neglected the talents of everybody else? Do we really think that was a better country? Uh, and, you know, so I, I, I think there are a lot of terrible things and the shootings here came close to home. The rally here obviously was several years ago hit close to home. But I would say people in my business um, are in general way overly negative. That, um, you know, if you ask people, is the country on the right track? 15% say yes. If you ask people, is your own life on the right track? 85% say yes. So what explains a gap between the part of reality they know firsthand versus the part of the reality they know through the media? And in my view, over the last 20 years, the number of negative headlines, fear-inducing headlines, anger-inducing headlines has gone up by nearly 200% because we've learned that's how you generate clicks. And so not to minimize the things that happen here, uh, but you know, most people are good people. Most people still have a lot of friends. There's been no change in that. Uh, there's been no, and I would say, uh, people think millennials are, had, have gone through some hard times, which for sure they have. But millennials, the average millennial makes more than the average uh, boomer by $9,000 a year. So you wouldn't know it from reading the media, but economically they're better off. Uh, and as for your generation, I think you're a Zoomer. I'm very, um, uh, in my view, my generation has created an overprotective parenting uh, that has induced, that has treated the world as if it was more dangerous than it really is. And so I grew up with, I guess my parents were, I don't know, silent generation or something. And when I was in third or fourth grade, they let me wander around the streets of New York free range. If you did that today, you'd be um, arrested. <laughs> and because of this style of parenting, we have made the world much safer. And so your generation is a lot, frankly, more mature than my generation was at an equal age. You do far fewer drugs. You do a lot less binge drinking. You have a lot fewer fights. You wind up in the emergency room far fewer. <laughs> you have far fewer car crashes. Just more prudent and responsible. And so I think that's one of the upsides. But one of the downsides is uh, uh, when they, and I'm, there, there's a book I've just read called Generations on this subject. When they ask different generations, how do you think about risk? Members of your generation are much more likely to say, I don't really like to take risks. And I think that's not only not getting drunk, but it's a little social risks. Uh, I think it's a little asking people out on dates. 
And I would say I've been teaching on and off for 25 years. And I would say the big thing that's declined is the willingness to have knock down, drag out arguments in class. Because uh, you don't know who's going to be judging you. Or, and so and I think a lot of that is social media and stuff. But so I forget where I started with this. Uh, <laughs> but I, w I would say that um, there have always been, at every time, horrific social problems to address. Uh, but that, in my view, things are way better than you would know from reading a lot of the public media. And a place like UVA, like we, you're in the national news when you have these events. But every, yesterday and the day before and the day before that, you had nice professors, hopefully. Uh, you went to class and you probably built some lifelong friendships here. So I think the loss of faith uh, is, um, I, I think it's unwarranted. I think it, uh, there's an overly pessimistic view toward the world, which all generations share, but because your generation only knows this version of the world, I think it sh shows up higher in your generation than in mine. It's easy for me to say, calm down. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna tell you what your experience is, your experience is your experience. But as a middle-aged guy, I am gonna tell you what your experience is because I know one of the things your generation likes the most is when people of my generation generalize about you. <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll buy it. Here's a standing offer, you give me your address, I'll send you this book, Generations, which has all this data. And it's it very useful in thinking about the, the generations. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. We are, we are at time, but we have a fifth student, the player to be named later. A fifth student of ours was, a uh, student of mine was going to be asking the question, but we're in the middle of exam period, and I think something ended up happening. So um, do you have a question to ask? Please do. Let's do one last final one, David, and then we'll thank you and, and come to a close. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's James. I'm here because I'm Grady's friend, and he invited <laughs> me along. Um, I guess my question is, what do you think the role of the informed and being informed comes in a big project like national moral formation or something like that? What, what are the people that are reading your columns and, you know, watching PBS to do about moral formation? Yeah, well, I mean, well, first on being informed, I, um, obviously the sainted New, New York Times, the sainted PBS NewsHour. Uh, I pay close attention to those. Uh, don't watch a lot of cable. Uh, don't read a lot of uh, the media, frankly, just because I'm not going to invest human capital in things that I'm not going to remember in six months. And so, frankly, I read a lot of books. I go to, there's a website called The Browser, uh, which uh, English language website, all the best essays in the English language are all around the world. They link to five a day. Uh, and so I, I want to read something that I'm going to remember in six months. And so that I try to, I revere a golden age of nonfiction, which was between 1955 and 1965. Uh, and in that era, there were people writing like Jane Jacobs, like Rachel Carson, uh, there's a guy named Daniel Bell. And Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt George Orwell was still alive through much of, part of that. And they were a little lower than academia, less specialized, but a little higher than journalism. To me, that's, that's where you want to be, asking big questions. Uh, there was a guy, Reinhold Niebuhr, in that era, who wrote a book called The Nature and Destiny of Man. Pretty broad topic. Uh, and so to me, that, that's the best way to be informed on the stuff that really matters not on the daily blip, the outrage blip of the day. And then how do you make a difference? We can only control the little world around us. Uh, and I, I think, you know, in, in this book, I would say that one of the things that um, I wrote about in this book, you know, I have a national platform, but one of the rewarding things that happened to me when I was writing about what happened in the second mountain, the years of the second mountain, was, you know, I had a, a really bad period in my life. Uh, and I had a divorce, I was living alone in a crappy little apartment, and I was doing what any um, idiotic American male would do when confronted with an emotional and spiritual crisis. I tried to work my way through it. 
And so I mentioned in the book, if you went to my kitchen in those years um, where I should have had forks and knives, I had post-it notes because I wasn't <laughs> inviting anybody over. I was just working all the time. And one of the nice, so I was sort of in the valley. And one of the things I learned in the valley is you can't get yourself out of it. Somebody has to reach in and help you out. And so I happened to look into, I got invited over to this house in DC. And in those days, believe me, if you invited me anywhere, I was accepting. Uh, and I go into the house and it's a couple named Kathy and David. And they had a kid uh, named uh, James who, who had a mom who was a friend of their son, Santi, who had a mom who uh, had some issues and couldn't always feed the kid, James. So they said, well, James can stay with us. And then James had a friend, and that kid had a friend, and that kid had a friend. So the day I walk in there in 2013 or 14, I walk in, there's 40 kids. There's 14 mattresses on the floor, 14 kids staying in the basement. Uh, and I reach up to one kid when I walk in the door and I say, hey, I'm David. He says, we're not allowed to shake hands here. We just hug here. Uh, and I'm not the huggiest guy on the face of the earth. <laughs> and yet, uh, I stayed with that community. We had dinner for about seven years every Thursday night. We did holidays together. We did vacations together. And it was easily one of the most, not only the funnest thing I did that, that phase, but easily one of the most rewarding, not because I was helping, we were just helping each other. There was no you know, older guy to the younger person. Uh, and the kids have now grown and dispersed. Uh, and my wife and I have not been able to fill that void. But finding that kind of community was just not only felt like tremendously fun, but just tremendously valuable and more valuable than frankly, what my university te taught me to do. And so I just, I guess I'll end by recentering us there. And I can't resist by um, mentioning that one of the things some of the boys in that community and one of my, my own kids did was play at Cove Creek um, down here uh, and that was that was which is a baseball field a baseball field one of the most beautiful youth baseball fields i've ever been to that uh, one of our guests helped one of our create. guests helped create uh, two of our guests <laughs> yeah. and you know to be able to you know just take kids who are you know not getting a lot of great things happen in their lives and to teach them how to pitch or how to bat just like i'm about to cry that was it was just a a um it, it, it humbles you in the presence of a world of ideas. So, I don't know. Well, David, you humble all of us. Um, thanks so much for your time. At several points in the book, you um, point back to or uh, quite humbly refer to yourself as a teacher. Um, I think the word guru <laughs> uh, and particularly if you read this book uh, and the idea of particularly not climbing one but two mountains is something that would resonate with a lot of people and it resonates with all of us who read your column and wait for Friday night, um, both because it's Friday night but because you're going to be on the news hour each week. So <laughs> it's really an honor to have you here and, um, and particularly uh, thanks to Jim and Kate um for honoring jim uh and his time with all of us as a guru as well so thank you thank you, thank you.